I was very lucky when I was a kid because we used to go out at night and sing. There is an intimate and ever enduring relationship between musicians and cities. Individual cities breed highly individual musical education, their culture and self-image shape musicians, and they form the bedrock of the experiences and memories that artists use to create work. Also, cities provide a spiritual nexus for artists to call home. No city in Western music exerts as powerful a pull over its musicians, be they native or emigre, than New York City. The birthplace of the modern recording industry, the finishing school for jazz, sewing bed for the seeds of soul, hotbed of disco, sewer from which punk rock crawled New York City, has stamped its artists indelibly, and they in return have sketched it in all its grandeur and filth in livid, vivid details. In 1966, aged just 19, Laura Nero began her recording career on Folkways, who, true to the label's name, tried to consign her into a folk rock mode, which was the only bag they could see her brilliant blend of girl group Ray Charles Broadway songwriting mashup fitting into. After an ecstatic performance at the Monterey Festival, there is a persistent rumour that she bombed there, but she was just an act out of place. Nero successfully sued Folkways to get out of her contract, she was a minor at the time she signed it, and took on David Geffen as her manager, signing for Columbia. Eli and the Thirteenth Confession, which most people seem to see as her masterpiece, came out in 1968, and it certainly does contain a lot of the songs we most associate with her. Sweet Blindness, Lucky, Poverty Train, Eli's Coming, Stone Soul Picnic. The album, however, tanked at number 181. 1969 saw Nero becoming increasingly uncomfortable with both the music business and the mechanics of fame. She was a victim of her times to a large extent. AM radio, which was still strictly formatted, wouldn't play her. She was too politically naive to be played on the FM stations, and Columbia, even with the super-hip Clive Davis at the helm, left her in the singer-songwriter bracket and failed to promote her. By the summer of 1969, her personal life was complicated. She relocated back to her mother's home in the Bronx to get away from Los Angeles and, so it is said, shake a rumoured heroin problem. She remained hopelessly in love with David Geffen, but seemed to be the only person in the industry, except perhaps Geffen himself, who didn't know that David Geffen was gay. Stephen Sondheim sought her out, wanting to work on a musical with her, but she rebuffed him. In September, her album New York Tenderberry, a somber yet dramatic suite of songs that took us through her interior world full of rage, loneliness and death and finally a kind of serene acceptance that bad will pass and good endure and ended up as a love song, through better and worse, to her life in the city. It's also very possibly my favourite album ever. The album opens with the barely audible strains of Nero's voice in the lowest register of her three-octave mezzo, almost breathing the cryptic line, Two mainstream die, her piano soft and skeletal. As the song unfolds, it becomes apparent you're in the centre of the psychodrama of Nero's despair at her abandonment. It's a raw wound. The dynamics are alarming, breathy, almost silent passages erupting suddenly into titanic chord stabs and wails, such tender persuasion. I want to die. I want to die. In her dark inner world, I got drawn blind blues all over me, rubies and smoke rings. She's still the lusty woman from Eli. You made me love to play, then you stayed away. It's one of the most remarkable album openers I can think of. It's crazed dynamics and jagged phrasing. Nero recorded it as she did a few songs on this album, sitting in a dark room with only candles for what light they gave, playing take after take of songs in no particular order, sometimes not even completing them, until the tape ran out and had to be replaced. Roy Haley, who was Simon and Garfunkel's producer, amongst many others, would then take the tapes and edit the completed takes together out of Nero's fragments. By the time the song is over, with Nero calling out for her, the sorrow of her crying days, you're in her world, her wildly sensuous, darkly troubled world. Captain for Dark Mornings opens with the smattering of the kind of galloping R&B backing Nero summoned up in songs like Sweet Blindness albeit in a slower tempo, but the Ray Charles groove is there and the opening lines are cooed over it. I am soft and silly. Shows that Nero still her voice, coy and playful, the piano and a percussive bass settling us in, loves to play and she's looking for a new man to be willing to die for. Her captain is medication for her reputation, grace in action to her satisfaction. She's been around the block, sold by sailors, worn by tailors and wounded by soldiers, but she will die for this man to be her captain. 
Captain is a theme that recurs on the album, but here we see as Laura takes a long fade into the distance, a siren singing Captain Say Yes. Like the opening song, it's fractured, dramatically dynamic, and takes some unsettling twists, probably as a result of editing pieces together. The brass, organ, and spare percussion fill the arrangement out beautifully. They distance you from the constant exposure to Laura's searing sensuality. Nero was a woman singing about a woman's world with a hitherto unheard appetite, frankness, and lustiness. Sex, sexuality, drugs, social justice, loneliness, ecstasy, and despair in what the French, who always have a term for such things, call an écriture féminine. As indicated, her music was such a rambunctious, ramshackle assortment of Motown, gospel fever, Broadway show tunes, break the end blues, hard R&B and real building pop that made her impossible to classify, let alone market. She was, and to some extent is still today, a cult act whose power lives on best through the voices that adopted her. For example, Elton John, her greatest and most loyal disciple. But Laura's music existed in a place and time, and that time was largely a pre beatle time that didn't have an easy niche in the wider audience. Tomcat Goodbye is possibly the most remarkable song and recording on the record. Accompanied by her best gospel piano, it's impossible not to see Rosie Pearl, the big blonde girl, as Laura, as she suffers under the weight of Tomcat, his infidelities, his neglect of her and her children, his squandering his energy on fripperies and bullshit and his stretching of her great love to breaking point, and it does break, when the piano becomes pensive and her voice slows to a blue slur, mocking Tom's useless dreams before swinging back to the jaunty gospel, to the point where she rationalises the act and formulates a plan to carry out the killing of Tom Cat. Go into the country, gonna buy me some land, go into the country, gonna kill my lover man. It's the intensity of the final 45 seconds of vocal is difficult to listen to. It's so raw and so final. Mercy on Broadway is, to my mind, Nero's reminiscence of her formative years as an artist in the city. Madison smiled as she hung with a band of strays. The band was gone, bringing it to the Broadway blaze. Once I lived under the city in my sweet July. Summer in New York, Nero would, as a young teen, leave her apartment at night and join other young teens to sing in subways where they had the best reverb, or on corners, idolising the girl groups and the songs of Goffin and King. She was finally to have her only Hot 100 entry with a cover of Up on the Roof in 1970. Mercy on Broadway points to that innocence, but the vibe turns to an innocence swallowed up by the city, in side streets and alleyways where the gay wine and doom swept the band along, leaving Baby alone in the streets. It's the shortest song on the album, but also the most musically manic. It's clear that Nero constructed this with a definite melody in mind, but it crashes through several breakdowns and changes in dynamics, as well as not strictly keeping consistent tempo through the verses, before it resolved into some kind of manic girl group apocalypse. Swinging hand claps thunder, Nero, who'd been singing in a low register with a very bluesy diction, hoarsely barks the final shine, everybody shine, before signing off with a bitter sounding ha. A lot of writers on this album will cite this as their favourite song. It's tempting when thinking of Nero's uniqueness, where not any edge of her fits into the puzzle of her contemporary pop music scene, to view it in terms of Michel Foucault's System of Heterotopia, a series of interlocking subsystems that sit outside of our everyday experience, mirroring, inverting, or commenting on the usual systems and behaviours and expectations demanded by society. So it's useful, then, to view Laura's music as existing in a little world where the frames of reference we used to evaluate it should be more directed to how the music fits into that world that Laura has created, not the one that our expectations come from. For all of her propensity to twist and reinvent song structure seemingly on the spot, Laura retained a deep attachment to pop song format, and artists who covered even her most complex songs were able to find and exploit the pop song engines under all the chrome. In 1969, artists seemed to suddenly discover Nero songs by the week ending 29th of November. Three songs written by her were in the top ten, and When I Die by Blood, Sweat and Tears, Eli's Coming by Three Dog Night, and The Fourth Dimension's Wedding Bell Blues, which has just finished a four-week run at number one. All in all, she wrote eight top 40 hits, including Save the Country, a pallid imitation of which by The Fifth Dimension made number 27 in 1972. Laura has two versions, one on New York Tenderberry and one issued as a single prior. 
The single version is a much fuller arrangement and at a faster tempo and a much abbreviated runtime, whereas the album version, which I prefer, is a lot more sobering, less joyous and more purposeful, and filled with those disorienting breakdowns and slight changes in tempo that distinguish New York Tenderberry. The frantic closing passage, which features the only prominent guitar part on the album, closes on a volley of horns that sounds strangely formal, not R&B or big band, they sound almost classical to a mournful final bray. Gibson Street is one of those alleys and side streets run off Laura's summary Broadway, where a hungry devil looms. I'm strongly inclined to pass this as being about Laura's fascination and dalliances with heroin. There is a man, he knows where I'm going, yes he gave me a strawberry to eat. I sucked its juices never knowing that I would sleep that night on Gibson Street. Gibson Street seems to be some sort of active prostration before the great moral balance of it is the city. Her innocence of wonder balanced against what that city makes her to be. Her vocal on this is one of her strongest ever. I read here and there people are pining that Laura's voice is an acquired taste. If so, it's one that I've acquired very readily. I find her a magnificent and instinctive singer. On the whole, she has remarkable control and emotional expression. Like a lot of artists, Laura's music dwelt in an interior world that had its own language and symbols, measure of time and sense of place. And when you leave the outer world and enter it, you're guided by them and can be disoriented. It's clearly not the same universe of, say, Merle Haggard or Sonny Boy Williamson, Taylor Swift or Prince Buster coexist within. Time and Love once again plays to Laura's instinctive strength with pop forms. Here she's in her Ray Charles mode, albeit with her typical playing, tempo and timing. She's her own Ray Letts on the chorus. It starts out as a fairly straight love song. So he swears he'll never marry, says that cuddles are a curse. Just tell him playing you're on the next train if love don't get there first. I'm slightly charmed by the use of the word cuddles there. But Laura is an old pragmatist, a holy golden wage, tells us love will see us through. Like Stony End, where she claims to have been raised on the good books Jesus, the culturally Jewish Nero invokes him again in the final slightly wonky verse where she concludes with, No woman is a fighter gathered white or African. A woman is a woman inside, has miracles for her man at night. First and second halves of the verse don't seem to flow into one another to my ears. If you want to hear a bad cover version, check out Barbara Streisand's Stony End album where she murders not just this, but two other of Laura's best songs. With any artist who works from an interior narrative, Nero defines her own mini-world in terms of both the emotional landscape and the emotional passage of time. And both Eli and New York Tenderberry mark this out. Eli as the anti-pet sounds, a lusty, druggy, salacious coming-of-age album. If they were novels, pet sounds would be great expectations and Eli the catcher in the rye. If they were posed by Keats, Pet Sounds is Endymion and Eli is St. Agnes's Eve. New York Tenderberry saw Laura introduce her greatest and most magical heterotopia, her own breathlessly romantic vision of her city. Man Who Sends Me Home is an alternately dreamy, impressionistic, then passionate and wounded piece, the shortest on the album but in a lot of ways the most complete. It's another simple pop song that simply refuses to be simple and it seemingly morphs into the soulful sweet love and baby. As with much of the album, Laura drops us squarely into her world and the languid and hushed opening verse which builds to a dynamic conclusion from an opening redolent of the miracles or the impressions but shows us a path back to ours with a structured and conventional chorus. The lyrics, again, don't provide a coherent narrative. They're more like sparks or sensations viewed from a fast-orbiting planet. As much as any song on the album does, this sounds like the one most likely compiled under the idiosyncratic circumstances under which Laura made the album. Captain St. Lucifer is, to my mind, and I'm no great passer of lyrics, cousin to Mercy on Broadway. In fact, in terms of the narrative to the album, it probably sits between Mercy on Broadway and Gibson Street. Also, I don't think Captain St. Lucifer is a name or a person as much as it is a label for the city itself. The city is captain in so much as it commands her emotions and memories, its saint in as much as it lifts her up, and its devil as much as it tempts her. It lies wide open to a full of impossible exotic danger and joy from her humble beginnings as what she sees as an impoverished and inexperienced outsider. She now sees her city for what it is, and she, in all her abounding appetites, will live and die and rise with it. Miles Davis visited the sessions while Laura was recording. They were hopeful Miles could lay down some lines, but after listening to playback, Miles demurred, saying he couldn't contribute anything because the music was already perfect. One thing I also like very much about this album is the album cover photographed by David Garr. I think he also may have taken that great photo of Miles Davis on the cover of the Jack Johnson album. Laura laying back in some kind of blissful meditation, 
wind blown and wrapped in thoughtless ecstasy on the fire escape city apartments behind her and her back and on the back laura looking decidedly mischievous and focused with promotion only not for sale stamped over her the final number the title track is laura's epic song of exile deliverance and spiritual gratitude for her city she fled its sweeping spires of sorrow as a girl taught by its secret places and bruised in its vices to return to it not as a city but as she says a religion much has been made of what a tenderberry is or may be to me it's clear that the tenderberry is nearer herself and this her silent song of innocence and experience she gives herself up utterly to the one master that has truly challenged her satisfied her and given her hope in new york city Laura had two more remarkable albums left in her Christmas and the Beads of Sweat, made in 1970 down in Muscle Shoals, with Dwayne Allman and Co., which was less intent and somewhat more direct than Tenderberry, but still a wonderful album, and Gonna Take a Miracle, the first all-covers album by a major singer-songwriter, an album which I feel is just shaded by the big four long stretches of it are wonderful, but there are odd clunkers like a brick-handed version of You've Really Got a Hold On Me, and the overlong and over-frantic Nowhere to Run. 1971 saw the major controversy of her career when she broke with longtime manager David Geffen, turning down his offer to become a Silent Records marquee first signing. Geffen was so furious, and he still rankles at it today, that he made Jackson Brown, who was then Nero's opening act and her lover, his first signing. Laura married, retreated to the country, and spent five years disassociating herself from notions of fame. Albums which gave hints of former glories arrived irregularly after that until Laura's death from ovarian cancer in 1997. New York Tenderberry is for me an album of long late nights where I struggle with questions I had to answer to myself and with what the hell was going on with this inscrutable record. I felt I got to know Laura through it. She's right there, so open, so naked, so defiant, so triumphant. The album that they released after she passed away was called Angel in the Dark. In those long, lightless nights listening to her whisper and wail, I know why I called her that.